Okay, let me do this. Okay, so I am going to talk about rendering. Now, it's quite a wide subject, and I thought I'd start with a little bit of background as to how I got to this topic. I had a pretty high level overview of what rendering is, but I was recently on a project where the type of rendering mattered. As modern day frameworks have evolved, the approaches that you can have when choosing where to render the content of the pages matters more. So I decided to research the topic and talk about rendering as I wanted to deepen my understanding of it to be able to understand what exactly is it and what does service side and client side rendering mean. As I said, it's a wide topic. So I'll start by breaking down what actually happening when we say rendering content onto a web page in the browser, which it turns out is different but closely related to the rendering we discuss when we say client side and server side rendering. I'll then go over a brief history of the web and trends that have had an impact on rendering approaches. And finally, I'll talk about pre-rendering that is static and server side and client side rendering. So what is rendering and why does it matter more now? As I mentioned before, it turns out that rendering can encapsulate many different concepts and it matters because web pages are getting faster and average device speeds are getting slower. Most people use mobile browsers or tablets and 5G Wi-Fi connections that are not always ideal. So developers have started spending more time into understanding what happens during the render process and how to fine tune it, which has led to more flexibility in approaches. If you want to make web pages faster, there were two traditional ways of doing it typically, putting the page on a faster server or reducing the size of the page. These approaches mainly focus on the download speed, but what also matters a lot of the time is the rendering speed. So where does rendering fit into the overall flow of the web? To oversimplify it, rendering basically means converting the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript code into a web page that a user can interact with. In that sense, browsers, or mainly the browser engines within them, are just marshalling actions between the UI and the rendering engine. Here's a diagram of web browser architecture, and we can see that it's broken down into many layers. The rendering engine, the part that we're concerned with for this topic, sits relatively close to the lower level details. Every browser has its own unique rendering engine, which means that they all interpret the web pages onto a user screen slightly differently, although the big ones all generally abide by the standard set by the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. That's why front-end development requires cross-browser compatibility checks as there are slight variations. There are still relatively small differences between how different engines implement certain features or behaviors. So once a user requests a document, the rendering engine starts fetching the requested content via the networking layer in eight kilobyte chunks. The networking part is responsible for managing network calls via protocols like HTTP or FTP, and also handles some security concerns with internet communication. The JavaScript interpreter here is responsible for parsing and executing the JavaScript, but it then passes the results to the rendering engine. And the UI backend is used for drawing user interface methods of the underlying operating system. So it draws basic widgets like window boxes or alert boxes, for example. And the data layer here makes sure that we can store different types of data locally, for example, cookies or session storage. Before we get to the rendering process, it's useful to know some rendering performance terminology, that is performance considerations when we're rendering. So there's time to first byte, which is a time between clicking and the first content being shown on the screen. The network speed does play a role here, but it can also indicate a slow, uh, slow server calculations. There's time to first byte, um, which is different to load time, uh, which is how long it takes for a page to be usable by a browser. And then there's first paint, which just means any time it takes for the first pixel to be visible to the user. Um, that is rendering anything that is visually different from what was there before the navigation. Um, then there's first contentful paint, which is when the browser renders the first content of the DOM to the page. And finally, time to interactive, which is how long it takes for the page to become fully interactive. A page is considered fully interactive, according to the Chrome developer site, when the page displays useful content, which is measured by first contentful paint. Event handlers are registered for the most visible elements, and the page responds to user interactions within 50 milliseconds. So what's involved in the initial view of a web page? The critical rendering path is a sequence of steps the browser goes through to convert the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript into pixels onto the screen. 
It's a technique used to optimize the loading and rendering of web pages to improve their perceived performance. It involves identifying the minimum set of resources needed to render the above the fold content, which is the content visible without needing to scroll um, of a web page and prioritizing their loading and rendering. The critical rendering path process can involve both server side and client side optimizations. On the server side, techniques such as code minification, image optimization, and caching can be used to reduce the size and improve the loading speed. On the client side, the browser is responsible for loading and rendering the critical resources. Therefore, while critical path rendering optimization involves server side optimizations, the final rendering of the resources do happen on the browser. The browser is responsible for downloading, displaying the content such as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and images needed to actually render the above, above fold content of the web page. And it has to convert those bytes into pixels. The main elements, which I'll go through in a little bit more detail in the following slides, are the construction of the rendered layout and paint. So the first step is that the DOM tree is constructed. Bytes are converted into characters, which are converted into tokens and then nodes, and then an object model is made. Every time the browser processes HTML markup, it goes through all of these steps. So converting the bytes into tokens and then nodes. So you receive the pages bytes, the browser converts it into pixels um, that you see on the screen. The next part is that the CSS object model is constructed, which follows a very similar process uh, to the DOM tree. It's important to note that this is a blocking process, which means that the parsing of the rest of the HTML is halted until it's handled. Um, similar processes for images and other assets um, are made for link tags, for example. And for each visible node on the DOM, the appropriate matching CSS object model rules are found and applied. The combination of the DOM tree and the CSS object model tree from a render tree, which contains the nodes that are rendered onto the screen with their corresponding styles. And then we get to the layout stage. This is a stage at which everything is calculated into pixels. For example, if you say 50% width on the browser, that calculates that into pixels on the screen. So the layout consists of the size of each of the pixels and where it will be printed on the screen. And it's also known as the reflow stage. It can happen anytime you insert, remove, or update an element in the DOM, modify content of the page, like putting text input into an input box, animate a DOM element, change a CSS style, change the class name for an element or scroll, things like that. And the output of this process is a box model, which precisely captures the exact position of each element within the viewport. And all of the relative measurements are converted to absolute pixels on the screen. And finally, we get to the paint stage, this layers the elements on the render tree and the browser draws them in the correct stacking order along the z-axis, which you might be familiar with in CSS. Um, this is a cool image of what it looks like on an old Firefox plugin, which no longer exists, but it's a nice representation of um, how it does this layering. Um, it's also called rasterization. And the compositing part puts all the layers together on, as pixels on the screen, where the layers are then sent to the GPU to draw onto the screen. Um, there are some really cool resources to check out um, where you can see all the different rendering stages and performance measures like this one, webpagetest.org. Um, and there's a whole lot of things you can do to make rendering more performant, but that's a whole other topic. So in order to execute JavaScript, the browser has to wait for the DOM and only then can it execute it. When a browser loads a web page, traditionally, it typically starts parsing and rendering the HTML and CSS before executing any JavaScript. However, if the code is executed before the rendering is complete, it can block the DOM and prevent the browser from painting the page. And this can result in a blank or partially rendered page, which we saw in the early days of the web, and it can be a suboptimal user experience. Um, there are techniques to avoid this, such as asynchronous loading, that allow the browser to continue parsing and rendering the page while JavaScript files are downloaded in the background. Um, deferred JavaScript execution is another technique that delays the execution until after the page has been fully loaded. And there's also progressive rendering, which allows the browser to display content incrementally as it's loaded rather than waiting for the entire page to load before rendering anything. So a quick recap of the steps involved. The HTML markup is processed and the DOM tree is built. Then the CSS markup is processed and the CSS object model tree is built. And then the two are combined into a render tree. The geometry of each node is calculated in the layout, and the individual nodes are then painted onto the screen. 
And then following this, the browser engine picks up again and acts as an intermediary between the UI and the browser engine. So as we can see, this is a pretty complex process. It's pretty impressive to think that this happens every time we request a web page. Um, and this is the process of browser rendering and the critical path rendering. So that was a lot. So let's take a break from the technical process of rendering and look at a little web history, which has informed a lot of how we render web pages today. I've added a little bit of nostalgic animation to these slides, which I hope you'll enjoy. <laughs> so in 1990, while Madonna was voguing, Tim Berners-Lee here deployed the first web page. Here it is in all its glory. In terms of today's incredible ecosystem, it looks quite sad, but in fact, it was revolutionary. The styling, as you can see, is non-existent. Uh, CSS was only introduced four years later alongside HTML version four. And obviously I've added this photo to the slide in case there was any confusion about that. It was just the text, but um, in these days, web pages were static in that they didn't offer interactive features that changed based on user behavior. Everyone had the same content and it was predominantly read only. Web hosting servers during this time rarely offered support for server side scripting, which is required to submit a form. So when you click the submit button, a lot of the time it would open a user e email client. As time went on, there was growing demand for web pages to be smarter. The common gateway interface was introduced in 1993, the same year that Mariah Carey came out with Dream Lover, seems like a long time ago. This allowed for the execution of programs and scripts on the server instead of just storing as an HTML page. These scripts allowed us to use templating, which meant we could pre-process HTML on the server before sending it to the browser. And this meant that the content could be changed depending on the form submission of the previous page. And it meant pages could be unique to the people viewing them for the first time. So one person's page view could be different to another person's. It also meant that we could add long-term data storage. The server-side scripts could connect to a database and apply template syntax to display data on the page. It allowed the web page to be dynamically rendered without updating the page, but updating the data source instead. Then came along JavaScript, launched in 1995, a year after CSS, and also the same year TLC released Waterfalls. Before this, web pages were only dynamic until they were loaded into the browser, as we saw in the previous slide. After JavaScript, we could manipulate the page and add user inter interactivity without page navigation. In 1997, it was standardized with the introduction of ECMAScript version 1, which meant that it could be supported across all browsers. And JavaScript code can be executed via the JavaScript engine that we saw built into web browsers, as well as server-side environments such as Node, which we'll come to in a later slide. And in the year that Destiny's Child gave us bills, 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 Ajax, asynchronous JavaScript and XML also came along. The introduction of Ajax meant you could retrieve data from a URL without having to do a full page refresh. It allows JavaScript to make requests to a web server in the background asynchronously without interfering with the user's interaction with the page. And as you can see here, the Ajax engine, you could send XML HTTP requests or HR objects, um, which is now a built-in feature of most modern day web browsers. Um, once the response was received from the server, JavaScript code can manipulate the DOM of the web page to update the content dynamically. And this meant we could send and receive data without full page reloads. In fact, fetch is just a way to make Ajax requests really in modern development. The client side rendering was adopted by early JavaScript libraries and frameworks such as prototype and jQuery, which made it easier to build dynamic and interactive web applications. In 2009, Google released AngularJS, which is a JavaScript framework that introduced the concept of declarative programming for building web applications. And this framework was built around the idea of using HTML as a template language, and you could use directives to add dynamic behavior to the page. Um, this approach made it much easier to build complex applications on the client side and helped to popularize the concept of single page applications which is so ubiquitous today. So since then, many other client-side frameworks and libraries have emerged, such as React, Vue, Ember, which have further popularized this concept of client-side rendering. And from all this, we can see that these concepts aren't particularly new. Um, client-side rendering has existed for some time, even though the frameworks that use it have evolved. And in the year that Black Eyed Peas released, I Got a Feeling, um, Node also came out in 2009. 
which again seems like not that long ago. It was the first server-side runtime for JavaScript. It had a significant impact on server-side rendering of web applications. Prior to Node, most server-side frameworks were based on languages such as Java, Python, and Ruby. And these frameworks relied on synchronous blocking input-output IO, which made it difficult to implement efficient server-side rendering. Node, on the other hand, was designed specifically to be asynchronous, non-blocking, making it well-suited for server-side rendering when many requests could be coming in at once. With Node, developers could use JavaScript for server-side programming, which made it easier to share the code between the client and server too. Node has also led to the development of other popular JavaScript-based frameworks, such as Next, which uses it to generate server-side, uh, server-rendered HTML web applications built with React. These frameworks have become popular in server-side rendering because they offer powerful features such as automatic code splitting and static site generation. It also has a fast rendering time as it can, it can be used to build fast and efficient servers, which is important for server-side rendering too. And React came out in 2013 and the music suddenly changed and became less appropriate for this talk in the top 10, so I didn't add anything. Um, but what does React do in terms of rendering? React has ways to avoid blocking the DOM with JavaScript. It supports asynchronous rendering with React Suspense, which allows components to defer rendering until they have all the data they need and allows you to specify the loading state in a declarative way. It can also improve the performance of web applications by reducing the number of unnecessary re-renders. Before React 18, the primary way to render your application was entirely on the client. Now with server and client components as well, you can choose to do this on the client and the server, meaning you can choose to do the choose the rendering environment even at the component level. Um, it uses a virtual DOM, which is a lightweight copy of the actual DOM to represent the current state of the UI. And when the state of the application changes, it updates the virtual DOM and calculates the minimal set of changes needed to update it. And it does this using the React DOM library, which has the render method on it, which instead of directly manipulating the DOM with plain JavaScript, allows you to use React to do so. Again, some terminology about rendering here. So server-side rendering really means regen uh, rendering that means generating HTML on the server in response to navigation. And client-side rendering is rendering in the browser generally using the DOM. And rehabilitation means filling in the HTML by attaching event listeners, restoring lost state, and making the page fully interactive if it requires it. So it's hydrating the dry elements with the water of interactivity and event handlers. Pre-rendering encapsulates a few different types of rendering too. Firstly, static site generation, where the set of files is generated on the server and sent to the client. This includes any JavaScript code that fetches data from APIs or performs any other tasks required to render the content of the page. It makes sense to use pre-rendering for, pre for websites or applications that don't have complex client-side logic or interactivity. The first iterations of the web that we saw use static site generation. Any client-side interactivity would still require JavaScript to be executed in the user's browser. In static site generation, the server also generates the HTML pages for all the routes in the application and stores them as static files. And another form of pre-rendering is lazy loading, where you defer the loading state of any large assets until they're requested by the user. As we said before, pre-rendering is a process of generating the static part of the HTML before it's served to the user. The framework Next uses this by default and it has an example that shows quite nicely what's happening um, on its website. So here's the example. Um, it says that if you disable JavaScript on the Next page itself, which is built in Next and refresh, it still loads the content and suggests if you go to create React app version, which is all client side rendering and do the same, it will give you this message that says you need to enable JavaScript to run this app. So this shows you what the advantages of pre-rendering are, that you can see the content immediately. So pre-rendering with hydration improves SEO and decreases initial load time. So in server-side rendering, the server performs the following rendering tasks. It does template rendering, where it retrieves the HTML template and renders it with dynamic data to generate the final HTML page. 
And the server can only optimize the delivery of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript resources to the browser, but it cannot control how the browser performs the final rendering of the page. Um, it does data fetching. The server retrieves the necessary data from the database to render the page. Styling, the server applies the necessary styles to the HTML page defined in the style sheets. Script execution, it executes any necessary JavaScript code required to render the page. And so server-side rendering generates HTML and CSS markup for a page on the server in response to navigation. This avoids additional round trips for data fetching and templating on the client since it's handled before the browser gets a response. And that flow we discussed earlier works by generating as much of the HTML markup on the server side. However, once the browser has received the initial content, a sort of blueprint, it takes over the critical rendering path and continues the rendering process on the client side. So it gets the HTML and bytes as already constructed. And if there's JavaScript code that needs to be executed dynamically based on user interaction, that code will not be executed during pre-rendering, but instead will be executed on the client's browser when the user interacts with the page. So generally server-side rendering produces first paint and first contentful paint view of, on the server, which means a faster time to interact with one of those performance metrics we saw earlier. In server-side rendering, the critical rendering path can be optimized on the server too, which is the benefit of using this approach for complex web apps. So JavaScript code can be loaded and executed at different stages of the rendering process, depending on some of the tools used as well. Some server-side frameworks such as Next load and execute the JavaScript code before rendering the HTML content on the page, while others such as Nuxt load and execute code, JavaScript code after rendering the HTML content but it's all still done on the server. Effectively, the page is viewable before it's interactable because the server renders the non-interactable elements before it hits the browser. So what is it good for? Server-side rendering is good for pages with dynamic or personalized content. It can help ensure that the personalized content is displayed correctly and quickly without requiring additional client-side processing. Pages with large amounts of data, server-side rendering can improve the initial page time, especially if the data needs to be fetched from a database or API. Pages with complex layouts, server-side rendering can help ensure the initial page render is fast and accurate, especially if there are many nested components or conditional rendering logic. Um, pages with limited client-side processing power, it can help ensure that the page is rendered quickly and smoothly, even on devices with um, limited processing power, such as older mobile devices and old desktop computers. Um, there's also an, an increasing concern as people rely more on mobile data and have slower connection speeds when requesting web pages. Um, but it's not particularly good if the user needs to see the most up-to-date information while on the page, so frequently um, updated statistics or live updates. And for that, you should use client-side fetching. So client-side rendering means rendering pages directly in the browser using JavaScript. If a fully client-side approach is taken, all logic, data fetching, templating, and routing are handled on the client rather than the server. And as we saw earlier, Ajax is an example of this. In client-side rendering, the website's content is generated dynamically from the client side after the server sends over the minimal initial HTML. And this allows for a more responsive and interactive user experience as the user's browser can quickly render updates to the page without having to request new content from the server. Um, the primary downside to client-side rendering is the amount of JavaScript required tends to grow as an application grows. This becomes especially difficult with the addition of new JavaScript libraries, polyfills, and third-party code, which can compete for processing power and must often be processed before a page's content can be rendered. So the potential slow speed can be due to the fact that the initial page load requires a client to download all the JavaScript and CSS it needs before it can render the page. Um, for experiences with little or no interactivity or live updates, server rendering can represent a more scalable solution to these issues. Um, some examples of client-side rendering technologies include React, Angular, and Vue, and these frameworks allow developers to build complex interactive applications that can be run entirely in the user's browser. 
Experiences built with client-side rendering that rely on large JavaScript bundles do have some tools at their disposal, disposal to minimize this. So they could use code splitting or lazy loading, which means serve only what you need when you need it to make it more performant. And client-side rendering can be a good fit for a wide variety of applications, like single page applications. Examples of single page applications include social media platforms, online marketplaces and productivity tools. Again, this is as client-side rendering allows for a more interactive and responsive user experience as the page can update dynamically without requiring a full page refresh. Applications that display complex data visualizations are also well-suited to client-side rendering, especially if the user interacts with them a lot. Um, by using JavaScript to generate these visualizations and update the UI in response to the user interactions, they can provide a very responsive and interactive experience. Um, an analogy that I found useful from growthrocket.com, they had a blog uh, and they mentioned this, is that of a supermarket. They say that server-side rendering is like driving over to the supermarket every time you feel hungry to grab food. And with client-side rendering, you get to visit the supermarket once where you spend time buying all the food you need for the week. Then whenever you feel hungry, all you need to do is go through your fridge and all the food is accessible there. So when should you use each approach? As always, it depends. So server-side rendering is good for static sites, for initial page access, and better if you're concerned with search engine optimization, which I'll mention later, but bad as you'll have multiple server requests, full page reloads, and non-rich site interactions. There's also a higher latency, and the initial load time for server-side rendering is faster than client-side rendering, as a browser loads all the base content and required scripts before compiling the usable content into the browser. But the following load times are much faster as the content is already there in client-side rendering, rather than having to keep making subsequent calls. Again, again, the supermarket analogy is good there. If optimizing for search engine optimization, server-side rendering is generally better because your web page would reflect the right metadata for the search engines. Um, search engines like Google use automated bots to crawl the metadata and with server-side rendering, complete pages are compiled with the right metadata from the start. And there are libraries that set the state metadata for you. So client-side rendering, there are tools available, but they are an overhead that you don't have to consider if you use server-side. Nowadays, with the introduction of React server components, um, libraries like Next and Frameworks allow you to make the decision where to render, not just on a page or app level, but on a component level. And this is a relatively new feature. But this allows you to have a faster pay, initial page load time and also reduce the JavaScript bundle size. Um, these frameworks also abstract a lot of the details away from you unless you request to take control over them. Um, and as the front end ecosystem grows and performance becomes a bigger focus, there are new approaches in rendering and where and how to render this content. Next, on the next website, they have a nice representation here where it suggests where you should render the components uh, on the server or the client um, and it also yeah it breaks down this this choice for you quite nicely and it gives you the option next also to optimize rendering on the server with static and dynamic rendering with static rendering both the server and client components can be pre-rendered on the server at build time with get static props that's the function uh, where you can fetch data at build time. And when you run NPM run build, for example, it won't refresh the data until another build has been done. Uh, this is good for sites with static content, again, like blog sites. In dynamic rendering, both server and client components are rendered on the server at request time. Uh, and Next does this with get server side props for when you need dynamic rendering. Uh, the method fetches data each time you, uh, the user requests the page. And a new request means that the data will be fetched again. The remix equivalent of this is the loader function. And I'm sure there'll be many iterations of these approaches, but I guess looking at all this, it's important to note that ultimately the fundamentals of all this stuff over time have been the same. These are not particularly new concepts. So there you have it. The reason it's confusing is that rendering encapsulates a lot of different things. 
ultimately the, the meaning of rendering just means to make something. In web development, it's used in reference to a lot of different things as well, but it can ultimately be broken down into many steps, but it's come to mean where the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are built. I hope that this has given you a slightly better understanding of what happens when you render something and will help you make a few better decisions uh, if you where you should be rendering things in the future. Thank you very much.